Hello, I'm Dr. Edith Mitchell, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity entitled Racial and Ethnic Disparities and Health Inequity in Prostate Cancer Care. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide and is supported by an educational grant from Johnson and Johnson Institute and the Johnson and Johnson family of companies. Now let me introduce your faculty for tonight. Again, I'm Dr. Edith Mitchell. I'm clinical professor of medicine and medical oncology in the Department of Medical Oncology and director of the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. I am also associate director of diversity affairs at the Sydney Kimball Cancer Center at Jefferson Health in Philadelphia, PA. Uh, I am also the 116th president of the National Medical Association. And joining me today is my colleague, um, Dr. Randy Vence, who is assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals and director of minority men's health at Color um, Men's Health Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Vance. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Let's start by reviewing the objectives for today's session. After participating in today's activity, clinicians should be able to understand and acknowledge the influence of bias, disparities, and inequities on prostate cancer care. As you know, prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men in the United States and contributes to over 35,000 deaths annually. However, the incident and rate of death are much higher among Black men than in any other racial or ethnic group. Not only that, prostate cancer occurs about five years earlier in Black men than in other uh, racial and ethnic groups in the United States. So today we'll be discussing how historical acts have a present day impact, uh, reviewing the disparities of social determinants of health and the influence on prostate cancer death rates, reviewing the racial and ethnic disparities in prostate cancer continuum, and finally discussing potential strategies to improve the current uh, disparities. So at this time, I present to you, Dr. Vance. Go ahead, Randy, please. All right, thank you again, Dr. Mitchell. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about such a critical issue. But one of the things I always like to do, um, because I know that as many people who will listen to this and they might have no idea who I am um, because I'm still very early on in my career. And so with that being said, I like to give an introduction of myself and who I am. So that way many people will know why these are issues that I not only study, but are issues that are very proximal to me and the man that I am today. So as stated, I've recently accepted an assistant professorship um, at University Hospitals Case Western Reserve. However, before doing that, uh, I completed a three-year fellowship in urologic oncology at the University of Michigan. 
While there, I also obtained a master's in computational medicine and bioinformatics. I served on a few society, excuse me, committees for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, mainly around increasing representation in medicine, as well as addressing social determinants of health. In addition to the assistant professorship, I'm also the inaugural director of Minority Men's Health here at University Hospitals and at the Cutler Men's Health Center. But before any of that, before any of you know the degrees or anything like that, um, I think it's important to say that I'm a black man that's from West Baltimore. So again, while these are issues that I've researched, they're also things that I've lived through. And so they're extremely proximal to me and the man that I am today and shape a lot of my career ambitions and passions. And so now that we got that out the way, I want to start by discussing how historical acts have a current day impact. And to do that, I think it's important to go all the way back to the times of slavery and discuss there and then kind of progress from there. So one of the things that is not mentioned often when it comes to slavery is that it was a major economic engine for our developing country. In fact, both blacks and white, white citizens were enslaved together and if you think about the brutal conditions of slavery, then you now can come to understand why many people, regardless of race, began to work together to escape. So there needed to be a divide drawing, and race was that divide. So what ends up happening was poor white people became overseers while black people remained enslaved. In fact, this also allowed people who are proponents of slavery to now have uh, quote unquote biological justification for slavery. And we, again, have this concept of racialization that occurs. And within that, because race, was a, race is a social construct, not a biological one, we end up with these ambiguous blood fractioning laws, such as things like the one eighth rule. And it reminds me of this quote from the author Ta-Nehisi Coates, where she says, race is the child of racism, not the father. I think that accurately surmises exactly what we're talking about when we talk about the development and the creation of race itself. And so if we state that differently, then we would state that racism is the driver for the creation of race, not the other way around. And so as we move from slavery to post-Civil War era, to civil rights era, to where we are now, we've had countless laws and policies that have impacted what we now discuss as social determinants of health. Before I dive into the social determinants of health and disparities we see within them, I, I want to just define exactly what social determinants of health are. And so if you look at the Department of Health and Human Services definition, they have a Healthy People 2030 initiative. On it, they define social determinants of health as the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, work, play, worship and age that affect a wide range of health functions and quality of life outcomes and risk. Furthermore, they give examples of social determinants of health, which include things like racism, education, pollution, numerous others. And then they also break down social determinants of health into five different domains. And those domains are healthcare, access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, economic stability, and education access and quality. And before we start talking about disparities within prostate cancer specifically, I want to just touch on each domain so that our listeners are aware of some of the disparities that exist within each one of these domains within social determinants of health. And I'll start with healthcare access and quality. Now, I'm sure the majority of the listeners that will hear us have this discussion are aware that Black patients are more likely to be underinsured or uninsured. In addition, compared to their white counterparts, they're less likely to receive the same quality of care and less likely to have preventative services or preventative medicine visits, thus accessing the healthcare system through emergency rooms rather than through a primary care physician. So that's healthcare access and quality. I wanna move on to neighborhood and built environment. And I, 
to discuss this, I'm reminded of a study that was published out of University of Washington, which they looked at pollution levels nationwide. And what they found is that pollution levels, not coincidentally, are highest in areas that are predominantly populated by people of color, specifically Black people. In fact, and I quote the author said, the inequities we report are a result of systemic racism. Over time, people of color and pollution have been pushed together, not just in a few cases, but in nearly all emissions. And so when we talk about neighborhood um, environment and context, next, I want to go from pollution to food insecurity, and we can couple this data with data from the USDA, excuse me, that shows that Black people are more likely to experience food insecurity. And now you can start to see how these disparities within social determinants of health are interconnected and stretch across multiple areas of our daily lives. So the next domain was social and community context. And to kind of describe this to listeners, what I want you to think about is the fact that violent crime and poverty are linked. To state that another way, poverty as poverty increases within a community, so do the rates of violent crime. And this in itself can be a potential stressor and have deleterious impacts on our patients' daily lives and health. And if it's hard for a listener to understand this, just close your eyes and think about the fact that if you are a teenager growing up in an undisturbed area that is high in poverty, high in violence, how many times do you need to see someone that you care or love beaten, robbed, stabbed, shot, even potentially murdered before you start to wonder, am I next? And even with that, Think about that proverbial monkey that it puts on your back on a daily basis. And now you can start to see why this is a potential stressor and can have deleterious impacts on patients um, in terms of their health. So, so I'd next, like to ask you a question now, Dr. Vance. Yeah, thank you. There are studies showing that uh, for follow-up of uh, prostate cancer screening, that uh, for Black physicians, uh, there is a better follow-up mm -hmm. uh, by patients uh, regarding recommendations. And it's recognized that there's a, a shortage of Black physicians in this country when you think about African Americans make up about 13% mm -hmm. of the population in the United States. Yes, However, for physicians, it's less than 5% for practicing physicians. And for specialists and subspecialists, uh, that number is even lower than 4%. Mm -hmm. So what are your ideas about the shortage of Black physicians and how that plays a role in prostate cancer healthcare? So that's actually something that um, is shown in the data, like you said, um, in terms of the quality of care that's received and the perceived quality of care that um, is received from patients. So, you know, it's not just within prostate cancer, it's across multiple disease, <clears throat> uh, diseases um, or specialties, should I say. The role of representation in medicine is crucial, not only to the issues that you just touched on in terms of receipt of care, the quality of receipt of care, the follow-up, the feelings of trust, right? Because we cannot negate, even though within social determinants of health, it's not something that we directly discuss, but trust in the medical system is something that is also lacking amongst a lot of um, Black patients and Black people across this country, not only because of historical acts, but also because of how they perceive is that they're not listened to when they actually do have um, a doctor's appointment. And so okay. for all of these reasons, like you said, the, the dearth of representation when it comes down to um, black people in medicine, 
um, impacts those various aspects. And so that's why it is part, that is part of a number of recommendations in my eyes or a number of thoughts in my eyes that would actually help improve some of these disparities that we, um, that we discussed. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, if it's okay, I think I, I would like to just kind of round out the, the, the discussion around the disparities within social determinants of health before moving directly into um, prostate cancer and the disparities that we see along the prostate cancer continuum. And so there were two other uh, domains that I just wanted to touch on. Um, one is economic stability. And so again, what we see is that there is a history of policies like redlining that people discuss that are into, ended up resulting in housing segregation. And so not only did, was it a lack of home ownership, but now a lot of communities have a lack of home ownership, but also increasing um, numbers of home vacancies. And with that comes along you know, increased poverty. And so the way that I like to try to think about this and break it down for a lot of people who might not think about these things on a regular basis is when you have an increase in home vacancies, it drives down the property value of that neighborhood. And so if I live in a neighborhood, my property value for those who have knowledge of real estate is dependent upon what we call comparables or comps. And so if there's an increase in the number of home vacancies, it drives down my home value. And the value of my home is how you assess property taxes. And so when you drive down the value of my home, you're able to assess less property taxes. Those property taxes are used to for a lot of areas to fund schools. So we end up with decreased school funding. And then you end up with these poor performing schools. And it's a vicious cycle. And ultimately, it leads me to the last domain, which is education access and quality. <clears throat> and so given everything we just talked about, I think it should come as no surprise that data from the National School Board Association shows that Black students are more likely to live in poverty, more likely to attend high poverty schools, and less likely to have access to things like internet. And so, I'll just stop there and see, um, Dr. Mitchell, if there's any other questions before I kind of dive into the disparities that we have within um, prostate cancer. So Dr. Vince, let's talk about prostate cancer. Yes, ma'am. All right, so I think now that we've talked about this, that it, it, we have a good framework for discussing the disparities within prostate cancer. And you mentioned some of these facts earlier in your introduction, Dr. Mitchell, but I just want to highlight some of them again before we go specifically within the continuum. So what we know is that prostate cancer has one of the largest racial disparities in oncology. Black men are approximately 1.6 times as high, excuse me, develop prostate cancer at 1.6 times higher rates than their white counterparts. And then again, there are disparities along the entire prostate cancer continuum. So I think of it in screening, treatment as well as outcomes when I talk about the continuum. And so we start with screening and we know that data shows um, there was a publication within Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers and Prevention in which they look at the demographic makeup of prostate cancer trials. And within the screening trials, which are how we develop our guidelines, we saw underrepresentation within the screening trials. So out of uh, over 176,000 patients who were enrolled on these screening trials, less than 3,000, excuse me, a little over 3,000 were actually black men. So that's 0.5%. So again, this is how we develop our guidelines. And then there's also data that we can couple this with that shows that um, when you look at Medicare patients, and this was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, that black race and poverty are associated with lower rates of PSA screening. And this is despite papers that, like the one I was fortunate enough to be on, that was led by my colleague, Dr. Yoni Shoag, um, which we analyzed the harm versus the benefit of prostate cancer screening. And so what we see is that since 2012, there has been a decrease in prostate PSA screening. And this is partially due to the fact that 
the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendation changed in 2012. But what we found is that prostate cancer screening is beneficial for all men, and Black men particularly benefit from prostate cancer screening. And so that's screening. And now I want to move on to the next part of the continuum, and that's treatment. And so <clears throat> if we start with localized disease, these are patients who arguably benefit the most from definitive treatment um, for prostate cancer. And it reminds me of a study that was published by um, Moses et al., in which they analyzed over 300,000 men from the SEER registry. And what they noted is that both Black men and, men and Latinx men were less likely to receive definitive treatment. And then even further, there were racial disparities within receipt of treatment, and those disparities were greatest amongst men with high-risk prostate cancer. So this is arguably the men with who would benefit the most from receipt of therapy, who are less likely to receive therapy compared to their white counterparts. And that's localized disease. We see the same thing pan out within advanced disease. In a study that looked at SEER and Medicare data on um, the analyzed treatment of men with advanced prostate cancer, they found that black men were less likely to, oh, excuse me, less likely to receive treatment. But despite having all of these antiandrogens and uh, novel agents, they were more likely to undergo orchiectomy, um, which is not commonly as used as it was historically. And that leads me to precision medicine. Um, so when we talk about discussing the treatments for prostate cancer, we always want to discuss precision medicine because this is a new wave that is kind of helping personalized care. But it might also be contributing to the disparities that we see. And in, in a study by a good friend of mine, um, Dr. Brandon Mahal, who was down at University of Miami, they looked at almost 12,000 patients across different ancestries in genomic testing. And what they found is that while there were some differences in gene expression across ancestry, that Black men were more likely to have to undergo multiple therapies before they had precision medicine testing. And again, this is to help direct their treatment. And even after the precision medicine testing, they were less likely to go, go on and proceed to clinical trials, which precision medicine actually helps us guide which men can benefit from being on clinical trials, especially within advanced prostate cancer, which is what this study looked at. And then there's additional data which is in nature genetics around genome-wide association studies, which we use for calculating polygenic risk scores. And when they looked at these GWAS catalogs, what you find is that there is massive underrepresentation in individuals, specifically when you look at the representation of individuals included in these GWAS catalog catalogs compared to the respective proportion of their ancestry or um, when it comes to the global population, but it's an overrepresentation when it comes to people of European descent. And so that's precision medicine. So we talked about treatment, we talked about precision medicine, and I wanna just kind of round out treatment by discussing clinical trials. And I'll refer back to the initial paper that we talked about um, that looked at demographic data across the prostate cancer clinical trials and specifically hone in for that on treatment. And what they found is that they identified over 35,000 patients who are enrolled in treatment-related clinical trials. And again, we saw a massive underrepresentation because only a little over 2,300 of those patients were Black. And then to kind of further the point that I'm making about the you know, underrepresentation and the disparities that we see, I want to point to um, another article that was published in Journal of Clinical Oncology by uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Jan Spratt. And they looked at the seven, uh, seven of the phase three random clinical trials that were used for FDA approval, um, specifically around novel agents in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And so out of this over 7,000 men that were identified, 3.29% of those men were Black. And then out of all of the men that were enrolled in those studies, only 150 of them 
the black men actually receive the investigational treatment versus the placebo. And so again, we see these disparities kind of stacking on top of the, each other from screening to treatment, and ultimately it impacts outcomes. And so I'll just touch on that as the next part of the prostate cancer continuum. And so if we look at prostate cancer in general, men with low risk prostate cancer are not very likely to die from prostate cancer. And even within this low risk population, we have studies like the one, and again, that was published by Mahal, Mahal et al. that shows us that even within this low risk population, black men are still more likely to die from prostate cancer. And SEER data shows us that black men are approximately twice as likely to die from prostate cancer as their white counterparts. And so these disparities, again, ultimately lead to black men dying from prostate cancer more frequently. But there's research out there that has shown that in what we have in the VA is the closest to an equal access system in this country. And a study um, shows that while black men coming into the VA system who are treated for prostate cancer may have had <clears throat> lower median income and lower rates of high school graduation in that study, they actually had better prostate cancer specific mortality. And so despite us knowing that black men um, are approximately, have approximately 1.6 times um, the likelihood of developing prostate cancer compared to white men, we still see these disparities again across the prostate cancer continuum. So we have lower screening, lower utilization of precision medicine, lower rates of definitive treatment and lower clinical trial enrollment. And all of these things end up leading to disparities within mortality of black men for prostate cancer. And so before I kind of move on to ways that I think we can move forward, um, Dr. Mitchell, is there anything in terms of questions or comments that you wanted to make? No, I think you have addressed all of the major factors, and I look forward to your continuation. Please go right. ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. So the first thing I want to touch on is that in terms of ways forward is I think that we have to start to, as a society at large, accept that race is a social construct. The reason I say this is because I think about my medical training and I think about being in medical school and hearing discussions or lectures around prostate cancer and the disparities that exist within prostate cancer. And the way it was taught was if there was this black men are just inherently born with these bad genes that cause these disparities. And if I'm being honest, I think this is a lazy and convenient way of ignoring many of the societal issues that we know exist that have a substantial influence on these disparities that we're discussing and even more broader disparities within the rest of our daily lives. And so we have to accept race as a social construct. We have to acknowledge our country's history and how this has current day implications on our social determinants of health. And one of the reasons I say this is because I think about a study that actually analyzed cancer mortality from 1950 to 2014. And what we found is that when you look at that study, cancer mortality in 1950 was actually lower for Black people than it was for white citizens. However, in 1953, NCI established its first clinical uh, trial cooperative, and that led to the development of first chemotherapy. We've gotten better with how we screen, diagnose, and treat all cancers since that time, yet we've had an explosion and the difference in cancer mortality, and we are yet to have closed that gap. And with the discussion around social determinants of health, we need to collect variables specifically related to social determinants of health in our data sets, because it is extremely difficult to design any, uh, excuse me, initiative around closing and tackling these disparities without that data. We talked about this earlier, but we absolutely must diversify medicine and increase representation. We need to perform multidiscipline research, no more researching um, things in silos. It needs to be across multiple disciplines. And I think we need to include our uh, colleagues from epidemiology and other social sciences. 
And then I also think we have to have community outreach programs, community engagement, where we can advocate, educate, and remove barriers for all citizens who live in the most underserved communities. And with that, I'll stop. Um, it was definitely a pleasure having this discussion. And um, you know, I'll take any questions you may have, uh, Dr. Mitchell, but it was a pleasure uh, having this discussion with you. Absolutely, you did a phenomenal job in discussing this. Um, there is a question I have, and that is regarding the number of practicing uh, specialists and subspecialists who are uh, Black in mm -hmm. this country. And the most recent data for cancer doctors, um, about 3% of cancer doctors are Black. Yes, ma'am. And we really need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And I was, would certainly appreciate your opinion uh, on some of the entities that may influence uh, this ratio uh, and the percentage of Black doctors in this country. Yes, ma'am. So, Dr. Mitchell, you highlight an extremely crucial point. And even amongst urologists, Black urologists make up 2% of all practicing urologists. So again, it, it crosses uh, multiple specialties. Um, the other thing that I think we need to really highlight is the fact that a lot of our major medical institutions that are the most prestigious institutions actually reside in places where the biggest disparities exist. And uh, you know, I think about my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, and Hopkins is world renowned, um, but we have some of the most pronounced disparities within the city of Baltimore. And it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Baltimore, or Cleveland, Detroit, Philly, Philadelphia. You see the same thing, which points to more of a systematic issue than a individual issue. Now, one of the things that I think we can do to eliminate that is to start these longitudinal pipelines and increase school funding. And so I'm talking about starting at elementary school age kids, not waiting until we get those who battle through so many different adversities that are now in medical school and now trying to recruit a small number of um, overall students. I think we need to start much further upstream, um, doing pipeline initiatives, investing in schools and increasing exposure to the next generation um, to the field of medicine. And I, you know, personally, I think about my own experience. Being a physician was something that was so far-fetched to me when I was a child that it's not anything that I even considered when somebody asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? I thought it was more likely that I could become an athlete if I'm just being honest. So I think that increased presence would absolutely go a long way in helping us improve the issues around diversity in medicine. It kind of highlights one important thing, and this is a saying that I kind of hold near and dear. It's extremely hard to become something you never see. Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Vance, for your outstanding presentation today. And I'd like to summarize as we end the program. Uh, first of all, disparities exist along the prostate cancer uh, continuum all the way from diagnosis through treatment, clinical trials, uh, precision medicine, and others. Uh, treatment disparities increase as disease severity increased with greatest and high-risk patients. Uh, what many people don't know is that we can uh, identify some of the factors that put patients at higher risk of um, a decline as well as death and mortality rates from prostate cancer. And these factors are not being utilized significantly as guidelines for treatment in Black patients. So we really need to make sure we are um, addressing the guidelines for diagnosis, precision medicine, and therapeutic intervention in Black patients. Black men are more likely to go without treatment or genomic testing 
to identify which therapies might be best uh, for the individual patient. So we need to make sure that we are using uh, genomic profiling in order to define therapeutic interventions. And disparities along the prostate cancer spectrum result in disparities in cancer-specific mortality. So we're unless we get our patients into appropriate clinical trials where these entities are identified, um, we will see some of the similar results with time. So we want to make sure that Black patients are entered into clinical trials and that genomic profiling is utilized to specifically address issues. Uh, so just to remind our audience that to receive CME or CE credit for today's program, please complete the post-test evaluation. You will be able to download and print your CME certificate uh, immediately on completion of the details. Uh, lastly, please visit the CME Outfitters Oncology Hub to access additional activities on relevant oncology topics and the Diversity and Inclusion Hub for discussions of disparities in healthcare, as well as there are resources there additionally for patient education uh, materials. You can also follow us on Twitter at uh, CME Outfitters. Again, thank you, Dr. Vince, for your outstanding presentation and discussion. And thank you to our audience for your joining us today and participating in this program. Thank you and good night. <laughs>